thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for putting me on the, on the program. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Ben Austin, who's a graduate student in our program, and Larry Summers. Um, and of course, I should say Larry and I don't agree on a lot of the things I'm going to say. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I believe very strongly against doing what I'm about to do, which is giving away what's going to happen in, in the talk before it happens. But because this talk is deeply sprawling, I feel like I have to give particularly those who are theoretically inclined some idea of why, why you're listening to what you're listening to. So the first part of this, this talk is going to be a, a flood of empirical things about the rise of joblessness in the US. right? Um, and which is going to relate vaguely to sort of larger questions about how the future of work will look. Then we're going to talk about the geography of joblessness in the US. And indeed, one of the themes of this talk is that worrying about income differences across space is actually somewhat different when we think about place-based policies than worrying about joblessness uh, across space. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, increased geographic sclerosis of the US, which relates very closely to what Elisa just, was just talking about. And I'm very grateful to her for, for setting me up on, on this. Um, and then finally, we're going to return to, to uh, asking if this should cause us, this geographic sclerosis, the rising uh, amount of joblessness in the US, should cause us to rethink, rethink the nature of place-based policies. And I, I'm going to talk about sort of three things. And here, I really don't want to get into an argument about this right now, because I, it would mean that I'd be arguing on very weak ground. But um, I'm not changing my traditional aversion to agglomeration-based justifications for place-based policies. I think those, um, those arguments require a knowledge and understanding of curvatures that I don't think we will ever have enough empirical precision to be particularly confident about, about whether or not moving skilled people from New York to Detroit or from Detroit to West Virginia, whether or not that creates a net plus. Unquestionably, I believe in human capital externalities. I believe in agglomeration economies. But I can't tell whether or not moving one to one, from one place to the other is a, is a, net, is a net plus. And I don't think we ever will. Uh, second, spatial insurance, meaning that if you get hit with space-based shocks, should the central government be in some way in the business of insuring you against those shocks. This is a perfectly coherent logical argument for doing this if you can do it in a way that doesn't distort migration, right? So if you did it based on where you were born or where the dynasty <coughs> at the beginning of time was born or something like that. Um, but it ends up being relatively small potatoes. And it's a question as to whether or not you, you know, only 1.2% of the variation in US incomes are explained by state dummies, for example. So you're not getting rid of a huge amount of the variation, even if you were going to go all in. Um, and it, you know, it would be incredibly expensive. And, and the last way of thinking about place-based policies that I'm going to try and make a case for is that when you have heterogeneous elasticities across space, you want social insurance policies to differ across space. So if you think, let's just, let me just make this real in terms of thinking about two US locations, but you can fill in your own EU locations for this. So the, we, in Seattle, right, joblessness is very low. And we think making it more difficult to hire workers or making it more appealing for workers not to have jobs is likely to have a very small impact on the overall level of joblessness. Okay. Um, in West Virginia, so think about a $15 minimum wage in Seattle, unlikely to have, you know, doesn't seem to have had a huge effect. There are dueling papers on this. But the fact that there are dueling papers suggests that the effects are small, one way or the other. If you imposed a $15 minimum wage in West Virginia, I assure you the results would be catastrophic. Right? And you know, so you really do want to think about having different policies in different places to respond to the fact that you have different elasticities. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through this in terms of a modified Bailey-Chetty framework for thinking about this. So um, I'll return back to that later, but that's really where I'm going with this, is that for me at least, the case for place-based policies is really a case for responding to local elasticity conditions on the ground. And it's similar to the point that if you think about how different housing supply elasticities are in you know, New York or Boston and Houston or Dallas, Right? Having a one-size-fits-all federal policy that, sub, that does the same type of low-income housing tax credit in the two places is absolute madness. Okay, with that, that's where I'm coming to. For those of you who are theory-oriented, theory, you know, just think about the last issues and think about why I'm wrong, and we'll return to those, we'll return to those at the end. Okay, I wanted to start with joblessness, okay? And I, I in some sense, think the rise of prime-age male joblessness in the U.S. is America's largest unsolved social problem. When I was born in 1967, roughly one in 20 American males, 5%, were without jobs. Uh, for much of the last 10 years, it's been over 15%, so a tripling of the prime age male jobless, jobless rate over this time period. Now, just to be clear, joblessness for me is the reverse of the, is one minus the EPOP relationship, right? Employment to population. So I'm grouping together not in the labor force and being, uh, and being unemployed. I think that's highly appropriate. A world in which you have an unemployment rate of under 4%, but 10% of men are out of the labor force is not a, you know, that's not a benign world. That's not a world that's suggesting that labor markets are functioning very well. 
um, and I will also try to make the case later, that joblessness is, in, in most dimensions, a much worse outcome than working and earning a little bit less income. And then, in fact, in some sense, an excessive focus on inequality relative to joblessness is, you know, is a mistake in terms of, of how large these problems are. The other thing that I will do throughout this talk is I will fo focus almost entirely on men. It's not because I'm not concerned about a variety of labor market problems involving women, but the issue of joblessness is just a different one. And not being in the labor force just means different things for women, and it's just complicated. And I, you know, I'm too simplistic a person to deal with that, at least not in this, not in this, this case. Now, um, in this case, uh, I prefer, rather than separating unemployment from labor force participation, I prefer thinking about just how long you haven't been working. So the blue line shows, and here I just have the, this comes from the, what used to be the March CPS, it's now the ASEC. Um, uh, I, I only have the microdata on this from the late 70s. And here we're separating things out until the total not working rate and the greater than 12 months not working rate. So the red line is, have you been out of a job for 12 months or more? The blue line is, are, are what share are, are out of a job altogether? So this came up to as high as about 20% at the peak of the Great Recession. This is, I think, a three-year moving average of these things. But I think more disturbing to me is this you know, secular rise of people who have been out of a job for a year or more. Um, and you know, we've reached over 12%, over it's maybe coming down slightly. But it's really, you know, it goes up slightly during, uh, goes up significantly during each recession. It then comes down a little bit during each, each recovery, but it, it never gets back to where it was before. And it seems pretty clear if you just look at that secular trend that it's not as if you know, standard anti-cyclical policies are gonna do this, do this work. This is sort of a long run trend in, in America, as indeed we started thinking about these things in Europe in the 1980s, right? So this goes back, this goes back longer. Now, I'm not gonna say a lot about cities versus non-cities, but since I am who I am, I felt like I have to mention this, and I think it does relate to the future of work. Here I've separated out the EPOP rate by uh, major metro, other metro, and non-metro areas. So as you can see, there's now about a 5% gap between major metro and non-metro areas in the EPOP rate. That, you know, the, the, uh, the joblessness rate is really a lot higher outside of metropolitan America than it was in the past. Uh, I think one way to think about this, and uh, I'm not gonna say a whole lot about this, but it's much easier to see what less skilled people are gonna do in a thriving metropolitan area in terms of participating in the vast service economy than it is to think about what they're gonna do in low density America, right? That it's very hard to imagine a world in which manufacturing jobs are gone and surely not coming back that what these, what guys in West Virginia are gonna do, where it's pretty easy to understand what they're gonna do in Los Angeles. Um, okay, now again, I, I've never been that impressed with labor force participation for men. I think for women it probably has more meaning. Uh, this is debatable. Uh, I'm not gonna do a lot with, I'm gonna work with EPOPs, right? Not dividing things up with whether or not you say you're looking for work or not but I felt obliged just to show you these things. So this is the unemployment rate over the last 15 years. The blue line, which again spikes massively during the Great Recession. The green line is not in the labor force and don't want a job. And this is a funny group. This is the 2% of the labor force, 2% of the male population who are not in the labor force but still say they want a job. So in order to be not in the labor force and say you want a job, it means that you, know, you are actively not looking for work, you're not actively looking for work, but you still would like, like the job. And of course, you know, some part of me that pushes back on labor force participation for men is there's you know, obviously gotta be a price at which all of these guys would work, right? It's, it's you know, just a question as to what, what, that, uh, what that price would be. Okay, I don't like, there's a problem with this graph and it probably should just stop at age 55, but this does cohorts. And so we start with the, the people who were born in 1940, um, and then we're just showing their jobless rate by age. So the 40 guys, they're by and large below 10% until they reach about age 40. So that's about age 40 for them. They're, they're hitting the 82 recession. So they're, they're experiencing the coming of age in the 1960s, a relatively strong period for the American labor market. Their joblessness rate is about you know, 5% throughout most of their early adult life. And then it starts to climb after the 79 and the 82 recession, and then it matches the other ones later on. These three ones all look together these are the cohorts which are born in 50, 60, and 70. They're somewhere in the 10 to 15% range throughout most of their lives. Um, the 70 group who, um, by 40, they're running into the Great Recession, so they're peaking earlier, uh, and we don't know what's gonna happen again. These are when, when the 60 group hit the Great Recession. And of course, here we have the group that's born in 1980, and they just look qualitatively worse, right? They just look during all, all their young ages, they've been you know, 18 to 22% in terms of joblessness rates for, for all of them. Um, this is by race, and this is the only race-based graph that you're going to see throughout this whole, uh, this whole presentation. Um, but race does lie behind many of these facts. 
So uh, this is, blue line is whites, uh, green line is Hispanics. Notice the convergen convergence of Hispanics and whites in the US. Now currently joblessness is about identical for Hispanics and whites. And African Americans are way up there. Uh, African American males was over 30% during the height of the Great Recession. So really, really those are big, those are really strikingly large numbers where almost a third of uh, prime age males. Oh, I should also say, you know, all the sample is going to be 25 to 54 year old males, so-called prime age. And I want to say as someone who's just celebrated his 51st birthday, I'm finding that very offensive. So, uh, but I'm going to continue to do it. Um, okay, uh, some other things you might want to know uh, about these guys' lives. So, most of them, most of the long-term not working, uh, have never been married, okay? So this is the share of never married men. Uh, and that started off at 30% and now it's, it's closing on 50%. So about half of this fairly large population have never, have never had a, a legal marriage. Um, over 40% and uh, under 30% for the employed. So marital status looks different for these groups. Um, this is uh, living with a parent. Okay? And you may ask how all these men who, you know, in the American you know, social welfare system is not particularly generous to, to non-employed men, and yet they're surviving. How are they surviving? Well, one way is they're living with the rents. Okay? And we have somewhere about 30% throughout most of the last 25 years that are living with a parent. Okay? So that's a, that's a non-trivial fraction there. Short-term not working between 15 and 20%. And the employed, it's actually rising from 5% to 10%, but of course it's much lower. So the living with, with parents is, is going on. Now, this is unfortunately pretty hard to see. Uh, uh, let me just try and tell you a little bit about what we're looking at. So these are the income sources of the households on average of these groups. So for my employed men, um, the total family income for this group, and this is from the uh, IPUMS and the, and the current population survey, the um, no, no, it's not. It's, it's 2010 to 2015, the, the ASEC, the equivalent of the March CPS. Um, $93,000 for employed income uh, as opposed to $60,000 for the short run unemployed or $38,000 uh, for the long term uh, unemployed in terms of the, the prime age men. Um, so there's, a, there's obviously a substantial difference in income. Uh, they're getting some money from government support in terms of the long run unemployed, but where is it coming from? It's coming from disability. So if you're actually expecting to get a significant social welfare payout and you're a not working man, you're in the disability system, which is particularly problematic in that it gives very high taxes on earning anything. Because if you go over the income threshold, you don't earn anything after that. And we know the results of Magnus Mogstad on using the Norwegian reform, showing that if people get to, get to keep some fraction of their work, they, they earnings, they, they actually do work more. Um, okay, and the, in terms of getting to this, money, uh, getting to this $37,000, obviously there's another, for most of these guys, there's another person in the household. So only about a fifth of the long-term unemployed are actually living on their own. So even though only half of them have ever been married, there's someone else in the household. So for 30%, it's a parent. You know, for the other, whatever it is, 60%, it's or the other 50%, it's a, you know, some other person who's covering them. Um, in terms of expenditures, uh, so here I've separated out between uh, low-income employed living alone, uh, long-term not working living alone, employed living alone, and total employed. Um, this will be useful later when I look at tax payments. Uh, and the reason why I've cut out low-income employed versus long-term not working is we're going to be comparing, we're going to be trying to calculate the fiscal cost of having people who are not employed. So we're going to be comparing not these guys with these guys, but these guys with these guys in terms of how many, what taxes we can expect them to pay were they to be working rather than not working. Um, this is a puzzle, and this comes out of the Consumer Expenditure Survey. Their earnings for these long-term not working living alone is about $13,000, and they're spending $20,500. And I don't know where that gap comes from. I, we've turned, taken a fair amount of trying to figure it out. You don't think of this group as having a lot of savings that they have floating around, but somehow or other they're making up for a $6,500 uh, gap. Uh, about half of that money is going on housing. So about 9,000 out of the $20,000 are earning, earnings going in housing, 3,700 on uh, food, 2,400 on transportation. That's actually a big savings from not working versus working. So the working households are spending 10K a year on transportation, they're not working, they're spending 2,500. Um, and um, they're spending a little more on tobacco products. Uh, okay, last thing, you probably know this from Alan Kruger's work, but I, I thought I would just emphasize it. Your view of not working men should not be that they are diligent house husbands who are spending huge amounts of time with their kids and engaging in massive amounts of contribution to the, to the family, okay? It is true that their household activities go up um, 
uh, these are three geographic distinctions that will come back later, but let's just take, take the Eastern Heartland, which is going to be fairly central later. It's 31 more minutes a uh, week on household activities. So they're doing an extra half, uh, uh, right, is this, is this a, wait a minute, this is, no, this is a day. They're doing an extra 31 minutes a day on household activities. A lot of that is yard work. So they're spending a certain amount of time doing, doing yards, and again, we're averaging over things. What, of course, is the big increase? Well, it's TV, which is already a fairly mind-numbing 142 minutes uh, in the, uh, for the, the employed guys. That goes up to 303 minutes. So they're spending five hours a day, if you're a non-employed uh, American worker, watching television. Now, there is some, uh, Eric Hurst had a paper talking about the rise of video games. Um, that's, that's only 17 minutes for this sample, um, but I, I'm willing to give Eric that, this, that video games may eventually eat into the spectacular time market share enjoyed by television uh, for this sample. Uh, so, and you know, they're, they're spending 16 minutes a day looking for work in this group and 21 minutes looking for education, but it's really uh, a little bit more time doing uh, socializing as well. Okay, so they're watching a lot of television, they're alone a lot of the time, and they're pretty miserable too. Um, so here I'm showing you just the share of people who are reporting extremely low levels of life satisfaction. And the national numbers are, are something like, if you look at employed workers who are earning more than 50K, only 2% say that they are extremely dissatisfied with their lives. Move to earning between 35 and 50K, 4%. Look at s earning under, under 35K, 6%. Move to not working, 18%. Okay? So it's just a massive jump in the level of reported human misery that's associated with not working. Um, this you know, has been well documented in the happiness literature, so the early Clark and Oswald studies all showed this. This is just a cross section. The people who look at happiness in the panel also find this. And there are a variety of other social ills, including you know, suicide rates, opioid abuse, uh, mortality of a variety of different kinds, divorce, all of which closely correlate with men losing their jobs. Right, and, being, and being unable to find another one. Which is, this is the type of thing that, that pushes me towards the view that joblessness is vastly worse than earning a little bit less money. Now, this is a geography session, so let's move quickly from joblessness to geography. Okay? This is the geography of not working within the US. Um, to me, at least, the region that stands out is this region here, which we're gonna call the Eastern Heartland. It's a region that starts down in Louisiana and Mississippi, runs through Appalachia, and ends up in the sort of northern rust belt of, of Michigan and uh, Pennsylvania. A bunch of areas here have non-working rates above 26% okay, for prime age males. So a bunch of these areas have areas that are more than a quarter. Now, for, for, for the European perspective, you all know parts of your country that sort of feel a little bit like this. Former industrial areas where you know, a third of men are jobless, are, are you know, uh, sitting around. Maybe they're not watching television as much, but they're doing something else. There are also these areas, and I'm not sure all of you knew that there was this big pocket of joblessness in Northern California and Southern Oregon. For what it's worth, those are relatively unpopulated areas, especially th these areas which loom huge on this map. They're like three guys in this area, okay? <laughs> so it, it's a, um, you should, you know, be, 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 don't, don't read that much into, I, into this. But certainly there, there are some areas of the Southwest that look terrible and then there's this pocket o over, overall. And the thing that's sort of a little bit funny is, it's hard to see in here, but you know, this is Seattle. And Seattle is you know, nice and bright and white, right? So it's all, and it just, it's, that's where the bodies are relative to the other, other areas. <laughs> Similarly, you know, this is coastal California, which is all sort of very low joblessness rates, but, and has a huge number of people other than, other than the other backing, background areas. David. Yeah, also in the south, uh, large metropolitan areas. Large metropolitan areas. Yeah. If you really want to sort of see, see it most starkly, um, Kentucky or Tennessee, are really amazing places where you know, there's a 10-year there's a mortality gap between Eastern Kentucky, which is here, and Western Kentucky, which is here, right? going along with massive gaps in education and earnings and joblessness, right? e even within a small, small state. Now, um, this is the, the reported incomes of not working. The darker areas here mean, mean it's good, means that you're earning more than $10,000 a year in some, in some way. Uh, the light and it means that is bad. And it's also true that you know, the areas that are worse here are also places that are having particularly low incomes associated with not, with not working. Um, this is uh, disability. So this is the reported disability rate in the US. And again, these areas, the darkest areas are over 19%, then 16 to 19. Again, this is an area that shows extremely high levels of disability. This map, which is sort of hard to see, this is opioid consumption. Again, this is an opioid belt that goes along with this joblessness. 
And uh, this is drug poisoning fatalities from 2013. And again, there's a little bit more heterogeneity here. Nevada is uh, you know, doing quite well in terms of drug poisoning fatalities, meaning doing quite poorly. Um, but um, again, it shows the sort of similar pattern. Now, this map, go back to this one, which is where we started. I'm going to take you 35 years earlier. And here we're going to use exactly the same scales, so I'm not going to rescale this. This is what this map looked like in 1980. Okay? It's not that the patterns are so different. It's, I mean, you still see you know, slightly darker areas along this sort of eastern heartland. Okay? But the levels are so much lower that it's almost a totally different world. So whereas the world of 1980, the world which is you know, really the world that shaped my view of, of you know, American economic geography when I started working on this 30 years ago, just looks totally different in terms of the levels of joblessness in the poorly performing regions. So whereas you could sort of be excused in 1990 for thinking the big deal is income differences across space, here it's really hard not to think the big deal is, is the fact that in low income and underperforming regions, massive shares of the labor force just exit entirely. And that just creates a totally different level of social dysfunction in, in a variety of different ways. Now, I said I'm not going to say much about women. This is one of the reasons why I'm not going to say much about women. This is the female, uh, not, uh, it's hard. I sort of feel OK for using the word jobless for men. With women, it's very fraught of what you call this, this not being, you know, my wife is not in the labor force, and anyone calling her not working would be outrageous, given how hard she works, or, or so it's, it's or jobless. Um, but the share of women who are, so these numbers are, um, are, first of all, of course, much higher. And it really looks much more like a north-south cleavage than it does the same sort of, sort of line. And if you line up female uh, not working with male not working, they're not particularly correlated at all. Right? They're just a sort of different thing. You can sort of see that from the map. And for me, at least, this looks more like correlating with American religiosity, American social norms, in a variety of different ways. So it's, it's, it's not that it isn't an interesting and important phenomenon. It's just not at all the same phenomenon. Um, OK, uh, one more map on the Eastern Heartland. This is the amount of federal government expenditures per capita. And again, this shows you know, uh, the highest levels in the Eastern Heartland, with the exception of some places like Massachusetts and Virginia that have done extremely well by the higher end of federal expenditure. So this is, again, going to motivate my focus later on the fiscal externality associated with joblessness, that this goes with big time expenditures. Now, um, we're going to switch to the second bit of geography, which is I'm going to show you some graphs over time and with a sort of slightly different way to view America's regions. So often you hear America depicted as being coasts and flyover states. This is an incorrect simplification because, in fact, there is an eastern heartland that is sort of a disaster and a western heartland that's really just doing fine. Okay? And they really look quite different. Now, the separation that I've done is not exactly on the basis of geography. It's based on year of entrance into the union. Okay? So I've divided this based on whether or not you were an American state before or after 1840. And I'm sure that leaped off the page to all of you who knew that uh, Wisconsin was made a state after 1840, but Missouri before. Uh, but um, the, so we're, we're grouping it on the basis of age. Uh, but if, obviously, it almost also perfectly lines up with east-west. Um, OK, so this is joblessness in the three regions. And as you can see, there's an ordering. But the ordering may surprise you because while the eastern heartland is certainly the highest, the western heartland is actually the lowest. Okay? That in fact, the western heartland has the lowest joblessness rate and has had since 1990. In fact, almost apart for a brief period in the late 1980s, it has been the lowest throughout the entire time period. Um, OK, this shows, um, this is not the share of, this is slightly misleading the way that we've read. This is the share of long-term unemployed men who are reporting being on SSDI or disability. And again, you can see this is an area in which the eastern heartland dominates. The other two regions are pretty close to each other. Um, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of the eastern heartland of the non-employed men are reporting on being on disability. And I should say, you know, there are two different ways of viewing disability. I'm not taking a strong stand on it. One of which is this is just an exogenous thing that just reflects the level of disability, although that's a hard view to square with the time series of disability, which of course has gone up substantially over time. And it's hard to think that Americans, there's no other measure which says that Americans are getting sicker or more unwell or more uh, as a whole. Um, the other view is that this is, you know, and this is very much the Otter, uh, the Otter and Duggan view, right? That this is since American men don't really get any other form of social insurance, this is been the thing that's fallen in to, to take up the slack on this. And, and this is America's version of having a longer term unemployment insurance for men. Um, OK, this is share reporting physical uh, activity limitations. 
So again, uh, you know, they certainly are saying that there are things that they, they're, they're unhealthy uh, and it's highest in the Eastern heartland. Um, now, just as the larger picture of the three economies, this is GDP growth in the three regions based on uh, starting, I guess, in 1965. And I'm not sure I knew going into this that actually the overall GDP growth has been faster in the Western heartland than it has been in the coast. That in fact, um, it's starting off a much lower base, to be fair, but in fact, GDP growth has gone up more quickly in the Western heartland than the coast. But both of them, of course, have gone up much more quickly than in the Eastern heartland. Um, if you looked at GDP per worker, of course, this, which is what most of us would look at, that has been, of course, higher in the coast, okay? Um, but if you look at working population growth or growth in employment, that is by far the fastest in the Eastern heartland, in the, in the Western heartland. So just going back again, Western heartland had the, the fastest total GDP growth, coast in the middle, Eastern heartland the lowest. Um, the growth has been faster in GDP per worker in the coast, but the growth has been much faster in terms of working population growth in the Western heartland. And remember, the Western heartland includes Texas, so includes places that have been just jobs machines over the last 30 years. Um, last point, uh, not last point, another, another point about the regions. Many of you may know about this you know, uh, fascinating and disturbing fact of uh, Anne Case and Angus Deaton that uh, male mortality rates stopped dropping about 20 years ago. If you look at our three regions, the regions with stubbornly high mortality rates for prime age males is, of course, unsurprisingly, the eastern heartland. Right? The, wet, the coast experienced sort of a, a rise in mortality during the 80s and early 90s, which was a combination of AIDS and crack, uh, and then converged back to the western heartlands. Since the past, gosh, 10, 15 years, these two regions have been the same, and you know, really quite substantially. This is a you know, 30 or 40% higher mortality rate in the eastern heartland for prime age men than, than it is in the, in the coast of the western heartland. Um, growth in male incarcerated population Again, uh, the Eastern Heartland now leads, although the Western Heartland was dominant for most of this period. And again, I, I said the name Texas, and that should you know, give you a clue about this. I mean, th there are parts of the Eastern Heartland where they lock people up on a dime. But uh, you know, this has is, this is gone up uh, a lot. Um, OK, now I'm not going to invest that much in, um, in trying to explain these differences. Uh, but I'll just give you a little bit of at least how I think about it with some regressions that go along with it. I tend to be a bit of a human capital determinist on uh, the causes of uh, regional success and certainly uh, not working. These three regressions show the share not working. These three regressions show median income. I'm regressing on variables from 1980. The first two regressions just show the college education rate and the share of the population that are high school dropouts. These are doing exactly what you, they would expect you to do with you know, t's of between 4 and 10, depending on the variable, uh, depending upon the regression. And a combined r squared of 34% in this case and 42% in this case. Um, so historic education, of course, does a particularly good job. And that presumably reflects both direct effects of earnings and any indirect effects going through human capital uh, externalities. We then throw in the lag of various manufacturing variables. The human capital variables get worse. So this is the view that these were you know, areas of the industrial heartland in the US that got very badly hit by some combination of globalization and uh, mechanization. Um, and that, you know, the areas that had more durable manufacturing in, 20, in 1980 certainly have more uh, not working today. Non-durable manufacturing actually has the wrong sign in this regression. Um, oddly, they both actually predict higher incomes, and that's probably one of the other things that's going on, is the legacy of unionized labor in the north part of the eastern heartland you, means you get a lot of joblessness because the wages are high, and you, know, you, you don't have a lot of, uh, uh, you don't really have, have you know, supply exceeds demand at those, at those wage rates. And then the last thing we throw in are temperatures, because you know, I always believe in throwing in temperatures. Uh, and they have some explanatory power as well. So, uh, you know, some degree of human capital and, and uh, uh, industrial, industrial legacy. This is just share with college education as of 2015. Uh, the Eastern Heartland looks bad, and it looks bad for two different reasons. One of which is, of course, during the industrial heyday, as Golden and Katz, among others, told us, it didn't make sense to invest in schooling because you had a ready job working for you on the assembly line. And so neither at the individual level nor at the level of the polity making decisions about investing in education was there a real push to, to make education better. These areas, of course, were the Jim Crow South, right? So African Americans were particularly being deprived of education, but it's not like white education was so great here either. Whereas our friends in the Western Heartland, which includes Iowa, right, the birth of the American high school, were places where the farmers saw that they didn't have a farming job for their kid. And so they were investing in education early, I mean, 110 years ago. Um, so they're much more skilled. And indeed, 
Um, the coastal states in the Western heartland both end up with equivalent high college degree rates in 1977. They've actually diverged, and I don't know whether or not this presents problems for the future of the Western heartland, but the Western heartland in its skill in, is starting to look a lot more like the Eastern heartland. But the Eastern heartland started below and has actually somewhat caught up to the Western heartland. Um, the second, you know, if, if you forced me to go beyond my one factor <coughs> model of, of uh, economic growth with human capital and you forced me to throw in something like institutions or political capacity or something, whatever you wanted to call it. Um, uh, this is, would be one way of looking at that. Um, I originally wrote a paper with Raven Sachs called Corruption in America. We, we looked at corruption convictions done by federal prosecutors. So these are against federal corruption laws of local officials. And the key is if you just use local uh, cases, a, a properly corrupt administration will never corrupt itself, will never indict itself, right? And we, we all know there are parts of the world for this is true. But these are the places where the feds on a per capita basis have uh, convicted the most local officials. And again, you can see that also lines up with the Eastern Heartland, that these are areas that are uh, particularly problematic. Um, the, uh, this is just for fun. Uh, there are at least some forms of regulation of labor markets that also line up with the Eastern Heartland. This is, this is one of these. This is um, uh, Steve Davis, uh, among others, have, have sort of put a lot of stock that declining American entrepreneurship rates and perhaps American joblessness has something to do with increasing licensing required for ordinary jobs. So these are the states that require licenses uh, for opticians. Now, just not all of you are, opticians are not the doctors. You know, opticians are the guys who tell you that frame, David, that frame is you. That frame is gorgeous on you, and it, it, it you know, and so the the if you if so the licensing for this is is to make sure that you know nobody nobody tells you know you that you actually you know should have round glasses and gives you square glasses instead. So that's what that's what this is about. Some of these measures also line up with the Eastern Heartland. So to test a bit of this, we just throw in the Eastern Heartland and Western Heartland dummies and see if we can knock them out. First, we add in individual. It's just probability of not working. These are individual level regressions. We first throw in individual education and area level education. So area level education is, is you know, getting at human capital spillovers. That's in this one. Um, that kills a lot of the Eastern Heartland effect. So a lot of the Eastern Heartland is just explained by education. But the Western Heartland you know, remains totally robust. And then we throw in a bunch of institutional variables like corruption, right to work state, which Tom Holmes found so impressive in predicting industrial growth after 1947, percentage of the workforce that's licensed, which does positively predict not working, although the T-stat is only two and some. Um, you know, again, the, the bulk of the Eastern Heartland effect disappears, but the Western Heartland effect we can't, we can't get to disappear. Um, this is just repeating the overall regressions over the past uh, 40 years. Um, the education effects have become stronger over time. So that's, that's a you know, general fact about uh, the US economy, uh, like the world economy. And some of these other institutional variables differ over time as well. Over time, the Western heartland looks like more of an outlier in 2010 than it did historically. So going back, you could actually you know, kill, kill off the effect or make it reverse itself in 1990. But in 2010, the Western heartland is looking unusually healthy. OK, bit, that, that was bit number two. Now we're doing bit number three. Bit number three is the geographic slows to America. Luckily, I can do very quickly on this because at least it did basically 90% of what I'm going to say. Okay? So um, it is just not true that US regional differences are larger than the past. One can often get an idea reading some of our colleagues in economic geography that America is more diverse than it was economically in 1950. So let me just give you a fact to remember about this. The poorest state in the Union in 1950 and in 2010 was Mississippi, both years. Okay? In 1950, there were 18 other states in which incomes were double that of Mississippi, okay, 18. Today, there is not a single state in the union with incomes that are double that of Mississippi. And anyone who has any sort of sense of what America's past work was, you know, has got to understand the years between 1865 and 1965 were years in which the poorest parts of America were just amazingly poor relative to the other parts of America. I mean, really fully, fully, uh, oh, I have a great fact on this from 1940, which is just in 1940, something like 85% of Massachusetts homes had running water of some form. I think actually full running water, whereas the comparable number for Alabama is like 30%, right, or 25%. So this is just a huge difference in terms of like what life was like in terms of one part in which modern technology was around. Um, but they do seem to be more fixed. And that's, that's related to this decline of regional income convergence uh, that uh, at least was so eloquent about. We've talked about declining migration rates and uh, Ganang and Shoa get at least some of the credit for dec the decline of directed migration. So the fact that poor people used to go to rich areas and now they don't. Uh, you know, I think that has something to do with the increased difficulty of building in high income areas. 
uh, the increasing segregation of the skilled, uh, for which Enrico really gets, gets primary credit for this, and the extreme persistence of local joblessness rates. So I'm just going to go quickly through this. This is declining migration. This is the intra-county. That means everybody moving around. This is the inter-county. For 40 years prior to 1992, we never had inter-county migration rates that were below 6%. We've never had them above that since then, and for the past 10 years, they've been above 4%. So that's a, and the timing of this is a little bit funny. Um, I don't know exactly what to make of that, but um, they're certainly much lower. Mean reversion, for, this is 50 to 80, this is 80 to 2010, and if you, I, I remember mean reversion, particularly these, these are public use micro sample areas, which are somewhat smaller. These things will be quite sensitive to measurement error. If you instrument for initial income, not using anything funny, but instead of using the median, use the 10th percentile and the 90th percentile, just to get rid of some of the funny measurement error. Um, I mean, the first stage R squared is like 90% for doing that, and you get a positive coefficient instead of a slightly negative one. So there's a good, there's a good chance that you're actually getting divergence over this time period. Um, this is how I see the, the skilling, and this is my way of looking at it, it's slightly different from Enrico's. So this is 1940, uh, the share of the population with a college degree or above. And this is the growth in the share of the population with a college degree from 1940 to 1980. So the places that were initially more skilled had a very large tendency to acquire more skilled people. This is the much weaker effect. So my look at this, the way that I cut this, because I'm not looking at log of H over L, I'm looking at change in levels on initial levels, that actually looks more positive during the 50 to 80 period than it does during the 80 to 2010 period. Okay, this is the exodus of the skilled from less skilled regions. And this shows the initial, the, the college graduation rate for non-migrants across American public use micro samples areas and the college graduation rates for migrants, right? So you have a lot of these places where the average migrant, 80% of the average migrants have college degrees and only 20% of the people who stay behind have college degrees. And that's one of, it's actually a great fact from Raj Shetty's originally Tennessee Star uh, paper was that many of the students who got shocked with the best education outcomes then left Tennessee, right? That that was a, that, that was a finding that he had. Um, this, one of the natural ways that those of us who have historically been opposed to place-based policies have, have responded is, you know, well, the answer is that not everyone should, you know, there's no reason why lots of people should live in West Virginia. There's no reason lots of people should live in Detroit. Why don't they get out? I think facts like this should give us at least a little bit of pause uh, because when people are getting out, they're the most skilled people. So they're leaving behind pockets of even more extreme poverty uh, as they go. And this, um, this is a fact I think most people here at least should have grown up a little bit on Blanchard and Katz, right, uh, uh, from 1992, Brookings Papers. You will remember, I'm sure of you, figure two from that paper, which has 1975 and 1985 unemployment rates at the state level, which shows no correlation between 1975 and 1985. Of those unemployment rates just absolutely eliminate. This is 1980 jobless, so there are a couple of things this is, that are different. This is male, not just, not just, not everybody. This is joblessness, not just unemployment rates, which would show more, more mean reversion. These are Pumas rather than states. But this is an R squared of like 80%, okay, and a coefficient of 1.08, okay? So there's no sense in which joblessness at the, at the regional level in the U.S. is disappearing at all over time. It is showing an enormous <laughs> amount of highly disturbing persistence. So the view that like joblessness is something which, boy, we just, you know, we got it and we, it's, it's disappearing shortly, that's just not the right view. And that's, that's something that was not in, in Elisa's presentation, so I, I spent more time on it. Um, yeah, Jean. And you have a lot of, um, if your kids were educated, they're getting out. If your kids manage to get college degrees, they're getting out. If your kids are not getting educated, then they're probably not. But I, I, we don't really have the tools for looking, looking at dynastic stuff, but this is, you know, uh, and we know the migration rates have declined for everyone. So, um, but I think that's the, I think the right answer is, is again, it depends on what their education levels are. So, um, um, la we also see these industrial cities we do, and they, they decline at the rate that housing depreciates, more or less, um, for sure. And they're, they're also much smaller, and they also have skilled people leave before unskilled people do. But I'm certainly on the, on the board that, like, you know, Detroit needs to shrink. Right. The right answer is not that we start actually boost the population of Detroit in some ways. But it's not totally clear to me that if you had a public policy margin to work on whether or not you were going to artificially encourage people to leave Detroit or not to encourage them, it's less clear that I would necessarily say that I want to encourage them to, to leave if the person on the margin is going to be much more skilled than the person who's left behind. Um, last point, in the 1970s, uh, Bob Hall did a 
a couple of papers in Brookings that were sort of Harris to Darrow applied to the US, asking whether or not places with high joblessness also had high wages and showing that they did, that there was a compensating differential for high joblessness uh, facts. This is actually states to make it really exactly comparable with some other things. Here we see the places that are high joblessness are of course poorer places, not richer places. There's no evidence for sort of compensating differentials. Okay, is geographic sclerosis an excuse for revisiting place-based policies? Um, Counter argument number one, subsidizing declining places keeps people in dysfunctional local economies. That's true, uh, quite possibly less important with lower migration rates. Counter argument number two, subsidizing any places leads to capitalization and rents. The poor tenant who doesn't like contemporary art may well be hurt by the Bilbao Guggenheim. Again, as people are less mobile, that may be less important. Um, I spent, in an early version of the draft of this paper, I spent an awful lot of time talking about capitalization, but I decided it was sort of second order at the end of the day. Um, the, um, the relative importance of capitalization versus distorted migration depends on housing supply elasticities. So this is related to Jean's comment. Some declining places, Detroit, you should probably see as being at the, having fixed housing supplies, that, you're, that you basically have no elasticity, which means that whatever you do is going to all show up in capitalization rather than distorting the number of people who are going to live there. Um, counter argument number three, some place-based policies can create pockets of high unemployment and low human capital. So if you target policies towards unemployed people to high unemployment areas, that's going to be particularly bad, right? You're going to induce there to be. Um, and counter argument number four, infrastructure place-based policies can lead to monumental waste. Well, that one is certainly still true, um, right? That in fact, we have a tremendous track record of doing things like the people mover monorail in Detroit, which you know, produce things which cannot possibly be helping the poor people living in those areas, despite costing hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, now, I, I, I think this is better for Tapas. I still have profound doubts about whether or not this did very much for the poor people of Bilbao relative to international art con connoisseurs, but at least this one is a decent museum. Um, uh, <laughs> I think the average museum looks a bit more like Sheffield's National Center for Popular Music, which I'm sure all of you visited when, during the nine months it was open between 2000 and 2001, courtesy, of course, of federal place-based policies for Sheffield. Um, I am not going to do this. Uh, but, well, let me just, there are a bunch of different things that you can imagine doing. I'm going to be focused on changing uh, social welfare policies in regard to local uh, characteristics. I will say it's sort of, when you're thinking about direct public investment, um, there's a justly famous paper on the TVA which shows that when an investment makes sense, it can do good things for local, local, uh, that does not mean that every public investment makes sense at all. And certainly I think if I look at the past 50 years in the US, I see more things which look more to me like the Appalachian Regional Commission, which, you know, you saw the Appalachian numbers today. It's not like anyone can really look at this and claim that the ARC fixed Appalachia. Uh, then they look like the Tennessee Valley Authority. Okay, um, place-based argument number one, externalities. So I think probably most people in this room, I mean, uh, there were higher numbers that were put around today than I, than I thought, I, I believe, from you know, D-wage, D-density in the US, or D-wage, D-agglomeration, which I thought that number was like 0.06. Um, can, but you know, they're generally accepted. Congestion externalities are quite real. Human capital externalities are probably a bit more contentious, uh, but also appear big. These externalities mean that a decentralized spatial equilibrium is very unlikely to be a social optimum. I believe that completely. I believe it's incredibly unlikely that we've gotten it right. Okay? On the other hand, I don't know in which way we've gotten it wrong. I'm not sure if New York is too big or too small. From a, from a, I'm not sure if there are too many skilled people in Chicago or too few skilled people in Chicago. And the same thing is for de true for Detroit. Right? I have absolutely no confidence about the curvature questions which would require you for, to do this. And most of our best identification strategies, whether on soil attributes or million dollar plants, seem very unlikely to enable us to kneel, nail down the type of curvature <coughs> questions that you would need to know for moving people around. So I just think this is a non-starter for me in terms of place-based policies. There may be occasionally times in which you feel really confident that a public <laughs> investment will lead to some sort of a big push in an area and will not depreciate, you know, that there's a convexity to return in one area and everything else is kind of linear and small, maybe. Right? But we should discuss before you actually spend a billion dollars on, on this. Um, Place-based argument number two is insurance or equity. Right? So in 1969, Detroit was slightly richer than Boston. Today, Boston incomes are 40% higher. Uh, surely increase insuring individuals against shocks to the local economy would be welfare improving. Probably you could do this in a non-distortionary way if you lived in you know, Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore, uh, and were allowed to ignore anything that goes through the democratic process. Uh, but place of birth based insurance policies are pretty unimaginable in most parts of the world, world today. Um, a, a related argument is that place may be a marker for low income and redistributing based on place may be less distortionary than redistributing based on income itself. The big limitation is that states only explain about 1.2% of income variability, right? 
And certainly when we think we're looking at states in equilibrium, there are compensating differentials, particularly lower rents or lower housing prices for being in those areas. So your ability to, to target or to tag based on this seems limited to me. Puma's explained 7.1%. But Puma-based subsidies would distort a lot more unless you were somehow or other managing to magically do Puma of birth, which I can't imagine a US policy could get through. So I think you know, this is logically correct that if you, if you were able to do this, it would be advantageous. But I think the upside is fairly limited. Um, now, finally, place-based argument three. Different elasticities imply different policies. Okay, so I've already said this before. Let me give, let me give two examples which I think should be relatively un uncontroversial. The U.S. subsidizes housing construction through the low-income housing tax credit, which bribes people to build housing. In Dallas or Houston or any of the places where housing supply is almost perfectly elastic in the U.S., this is essentially one-for-one one crowd out with the, with the private sector, right, which is the sort of thing that Sinai and Waldfogel found, that it makes absolutely no sense to subsidize housing in places where the, the private sector is chugging along, delivering $80 a square foot housing with absolutely no, no limitations on the stuff. Whereas in New York or California or Massachusetts, where there's a really a pretty big gap between willingness to pay and the cost to supply, right, it's not crazy to do a little bit of these, these subsidies. It is also crazy to subsidize new construction in Detroit, where 90% you know, of housing is priced significantly below construction costs. So this is an area in which almost surely, if you're going to subsidize housing, you want a different policy. I mean, you want vouchers in Texas, and you want you know, production subsidies in, in California or Massachusetts. Um, you would not want the same policy. A similar example, to just sort of help, help by analogy, hot spots policing. One of the things that effective police departments started doing in the 1990s was to throw police resources at areas that had higher levels of crime, right? There's nothing crazy about this at all, and that's, that's exactly the same logic. So, um, example number three, and this is an example that I want you to focus on. Subsidizing employment, right? Earned income tax credits or flat out wage subsidies versus subsidizing non-employment disability insurance, implicit taxes from food stamps or Section 8 housing vouchers, each of which carry a 30% implicit tax on, on earnings. Right? In high employment markets, and I'm fudging right now, and I'll just show you a little bit on this, I'm claiming that high employment markets are also places where the elasticity of employment with respect to various subsidies is small. Okay? And I have to show that to you, but I will show that to you. But at the extreme, assume that everyone was employed and everyone was far away from the employment margin, or everyone but three people who had negative shocks that were... I mean, in those cases, the distortionary effect of subsidizing non-employment are very small. Right? Um, conversely, if, you know, and, and again, my model in the back of my mind is just that I have a, a bell-shaped distribution of willingness to work. So the guys who are, there, where, where I have 3% unemployment, I have, a, I have a very small density of people who are on the margin. When I have 30% unemployment, I have a very large density of people on the margin. Um, in high employment areas, policies that deter employment may have awful consequences, right? Is the marginal impact of an employment subsidy higher in West Virginia than in Seattle? Okay, so I have four things. I have 10 minutes here, less now. Um, what we're doing, and I'm eager to have other people do this for Europe or other things. I want very much to be the first addition to this, this literature, not the last. But what we're doing is we're taking a variety of different shocks to labor demand and we're interacting them with the historic level of joblessness. So here we're doing a, uh, a panel. We're using state level Bardic analysis uh, and we're interacting the Bardic shock with the initial not working rate. Okay? And what you can see here is that, that the Bardic shock is much more powerful in its effect on uh, not working on those states that started with a higher not working rate. So that's what this is saying. So it's saying that if you have a positive shock to, to Bardic, that has a much more positive effect on working in the places that, that had a high unemployment rate to begin with. Okay, that's all that this is saying. Okay, this does the same thing with Puma level annual Bardic change analysis from the later period when I had Puma things. Again, you know, the interaction is something like a T-statistic of eight in these Bardic, in these Bardic shocks, okay? Next thing I did was, you can't see this at all, uh, it's less effective, but it still sort of shows the same thing. We took the Otter, Dorn, and Hansen Chinese impact, uh, Chinese import shocks, and we asked whether or not they had a bigger impact on joblessness in places that had higher joblessness initially. And the answer is they did, right? That in fact, the, the, uh, the last thing that we did was we looked at Steinson and Nakamura, uh, and they're, they're looking at prime military contract spending. The answer is, it turns out, at least when we looked at this, that the basic nakamura steinson effect is incredibly fragile to begin with. And in fact, this is not a very, very robust uh, fact and, to start with. If you squint, sometimes it kind of works, and in the interaction works the right way. It certainly doesn't work in the wrong way, uh, but it also flips in and out depending upon the specification. So um, I think we're not convinced by any particular number. But for us, at least, heterogeneous treatment effects certainly seem quite plausible. In particular, highest jobless areas seems to have higher joblessness response to various shocks. 
again, you know, um, uh, we see this as an opening for future work. And the larger point is that our, my view of place-based policies depends on such place-based heterogeneity, right? And in this spirit, we're also going to perform an illustrative calculation. Okay, so um, I want you to think about social insurance design that's going to differ across space. And you're going to think about something that is providing a benefit for workers. And I probably want you to think about these as kind of low-income workers who are on the margins of working or not. And, and you know, just, just imagine that you've been able to identify who this population is and you're not giving it to everybody. Uh, and then there's a, a, you know, a benefit that you're giving to the non-working people. And you can shift both the whole level of those things across space, so I could give people in West Virginia more of everything, or I could tilt. I could tilt, meaning that I'm going to do more to subsidize working and less to subsidize not working. Okay, so um, I think the case for a tilt, okay, if you think you have heterogeneous responses to subsidies, I think the case for a tilt is quite strong. I think the case for a bonus is quite weak. Now, um, this is the nice variant of this. So this is where Larry and I disagree substantially, partially because Larry wants to have some voice in public affairs going forward, and so he doesn't say things like, well, let's take away all the disability benefits in West Virginia. Uh, the, uh, um, you know, so the nice version, we have adopted a set of policies for poor people that create positive externalities and internalities from working. So the externalities are that we're going we're to parameterize is just going to be off of the fiscal externalities that involve paying lower taxes from, from not working, receiving higher benefits. I think there are also internalities, and I don't know how to think about the cost that you impose on your parents by sleeping on their couch and making them miserable by not, by not working. Um, but adopted a set of policies that create these. Subsidized working hence makes sense. We're very much Phelpsians in this. Um, but we should use our employment dollars where they will have the largest impact in West Virginia, not Seattle. We want to subsidize employment more. And we should be also be open to simpler subsidies paid to firms. So if you think that there is some lower, lower bound for wages that come from, let's say, minimum wage laws, that actually paying the subsidy to the firm can be different than paying the subsidy to the worker. And that's why Larry wants to pay the subsidy to the firm. And this kind of worked with empowerment zones as well that do a little bit of, so the Busso, uh, Klein uh, work sort of supports this. So this is the Larry version. Okay, the mean version, which I embrace heartily, uh, is I agree, but I don't want to incentive people to move to West Virginia. So let's tilt benefits from not working to marginal workers in distressed areas, not subsidizing distressed, distressed areas. So this is a world in which I'm not giving anyone any more in West Virginia, but I'm just taking a little bit away if you're not working and giving them a little bit more if they are working. So I'm going to ramp up employment subsidies in West Virginia and cut something else back, Medicaid, to keep the total budget constant. So this can be done in a way that's revenue neutral and will not necessarily impact um, where people locate, locate. Here's an important thing. I'm not arguing for local control, right? Because the locals face a whole bunch of incentives which are not benign. So wouldn't this still give the some, some people incentives to move to West Virginia? Okay, so this is the model that I have in mind. So I'll tell you, so I'm not gonna, I, I will show you one equation, but the model is the government's place specific benefits that go to workers and non-workers to maximize the social welfare function. Individuals choose locations before observing a linear additive cost of working. Okay, when they show up, they then learn what their cost of working is and they choose whether or not to work or not work. Um, the government's policies are going to provide insurance, but they potentially distort where to, where to live and whether or not to work. So I, I maintain to you that I can choose a, you know, a subsidy for working versus a subsidy for not working to keep you exactly indifferent between before and afterwards what I did with, with West Virginia. So, so because I don't know which state I'm going to be, if I can take... Uh, that's correct. That's correct. So I have to, I have to you know, you're right. It, it's, that's, that's right. Um, okay. So we can separate the decision across space, right, which is where nice and mean differ. So nice wants to give West Virginia a little bit more. Mean says the last thing I want to do is induce anyone to ever move to West Virginia. Um, and the decision within space where they largely agree, which says you want to, in the places which have a higher elasticity, you want to be encouraging people to work more. Okay. Um, so within areas, you have a bunch of first order conditions that kind of come down to this equation, which is the ratio of the marginal utilities of income should equal between working and not working, should equal one minus the elasticity of employment with respect to the wage over one minus the employment share times, this is the fiscal externality or whatever other externality you have in mind, divided by the wage. So that's, that's my equation. It's a modified bailey chetty equation. It's just saying that uh, we've just done it, uh, you know, so it's, so it's involving these two subsidies. So, um, we're going to assume a constant benefit of working over wage of 0.38. So that's what this thing is. We're making this constant over space. And that comes from exactly the difference between taxes and benefits for the poor not working versus the, the working before. Um, we're going to assume no personal cost of not, uh, forget this. OK. We're going to use Bardic and Bardic interactions to estimate E amp wage over space. And we're going to use CRA and a range of values for risk aversion. This is, this is, this you don't need. Uh, this, you, this you don't need. 
Uh, this is where we're pulling our interaction between the wage and not working rate. Okay, we're doing two thought experiments, first of all. Experiment one is assume that there's a benchmark locale with no employment elasticity and hence no employment subsidy. And then we're going to ask how big the subsidy should be elsewhere, assuming a pot of cash. And experiment number two is start the welfare level at 0.6 times wages and then ask how the subsidy should differ, assuming that the cash comes from uh, the non-employment subsidy. So you're moving things away. And we're going to show things for different coefficients of risk aversion. So in this case, this is the experiment number one. And we're showing as you ramp up the elasticity of the employment rate with respect to wages, how much should you be increasing uh, the um, employment subsidy relative to the wage? And the answer is if, if the coefficient of relative risk aversion is, is low, 0.5, it should be as much as 20% of the wage. If it's higher, 1, it should be 12%. And if you're like a macroeconomist who believes it's like 7, it should be, you know, like 10%. So, um, you know, and again, I think, I think the, I'm not going to go off on this, but the sort of, the sort of things that you need to, to satisfy normal macro puzzles seem wildly at odds with what I think I've seen in a lot of other, you know, more micro-related behaviors. So I tend to believe 2 is, 1 half is not an unreasonable number. This is, again, just looking as I change the elasticity of employment, just how, depending on different coefficients of risk aversion, how, how much the optimal employment subsidy should change relative to the wage. And again, it could be as much as 30%. And just as a, as a final thing to, to show, you know, we've got three states here where we estimate an employment rate elasticity of 0.08 in Wyoming, 0.14 in Massachusetts, and 0.25 in West Virginia. Um, depending upon, and this is giving you the optimal ratio of consumption of not working versus working, so in West Virginia, this tells you that if you believe a gamma 0.5, the not workers should have consumptions that are 30% lower than the workers. Conversely, if you're in Wyoming and you have a gamma of 2, you think it should be 96%. Okay? So it tells you that you want to move these things around uh, depending upon how responsive you think employment is to these subsidies. And then, you know, at least, at least in principle, you, could, you can, whatever you think, worry about migration to Wyoming or West Virginia, you can adjust the overall level to set it at whatever level you think is OK. So um, uh, money it should be poor places. I'm actually quite comfortable about giving extra money to poor people. It should be poor places. But at least if it's in the form of employment subsidy, the harm may be small. Uh, I'm certain that we need to shift the incentive to work and, uh, and to encourage employment, especially in high joblessness areas. Uh, this doesn't mean local control, which creates a race to the bottom, but it does mean that national policy, EU policy, should be different in some places than in others. Right? It's not an excuse for infrastructure, for attempts to generate regional rebirth, but it's got to start with a clear understanding that you know, we've screwed up as economists in our response to globalization we didn't, and, and mechanization. We didn't have nearly enough in terms of what we were going to offer poor people, whether or not in Europe or the US. I think in most cases, the case for an employment subsidy is maybe the strongest thing that we've got in terms of something that actually makes a certain amount of sense, given the various externalities associated with not working and the human misery going along with it. I guess I'm OK if, if you tell me you want to do it the same way everywhere, but there's a lot to be said for targeting an employment subsidy to particular regions more than others, particularly if you can actually ratchet back some of the benefits for not, you know, not working in those regions to make it at least somewhat, somewhat fiscally neutral and somewhat non-distortionary in terms of migration. Fini. Thank you very much.